Good afternoon, everyone. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm going to get started now. I know you all are eating. Please continue to eat. But if I can have your attention for a few announcements, that would be awesome. Thank you. Thank you. OK, so I'm Laura Everett, immediate past president for APA Florida. And I'm just so excited. Everyone is here. And hopefully, you're enjoying yourselves and having a great conference. Um, it's just lovely to see everyone together again. Uh, so thank you. Uh, a few announcements. Of course, as we finish up our meals, if you'll put your masks back on and continue to wear them, we really appreciate it. It's been great to see everyone masking up. So thank you. Uh, let's see. For those of you who did the downtown dash last night, if you haven't already, please turn in your passports at the registration desk, and uh, that way you'll be entered for the prize, which will be drawn tomorrow at brunch. Um, also, I should remind everyone, if you'll silence your phones during the, our speaker, that would be great. And I do want to thank, from the bottom of my heart and pocketbook, our sponsors and exhibitors. We really always appreciate you being here, so thank you. Yes. We do have a couple of exhibitors who were doing raffles, so I have a couple of announcements there. From the WGI booth, we have a lovely gift basket for Althea Jefferson. So if you will go to the WGI booth right after this, you can pick up your prize. And then we have from the South Florida Commuter Services folks, we have a helmet for Christian Kamrath. So Christian, if you'll go to their booth right after the luncheon, they'll have your prize for you, so thank you. And then before I do our final announcement, just wanted to let everyone know that tonight's reception will be off-site. We'll be at the penthouse at the Riverside Wharf. And uh, there's a number of different ways you can get there. You can walk if you like. You can take the Metro Mover, which is a free service not too far from here. The directions are on page five of your program. It'll tell you exactly what you need to do if you decide to take that. You can take Lyft, you can take Uber, you can take one of our exhibitors, the freebie. So however you want to get there, you can go. Uh, it starts at 6.30. It will have, we will have indoor and outdoor space. So hopefully you'll be able to, to be outside and space out a little bit. And there are some food options nearby if you want to catch dinner afterwards. So I think that's the announcements for now. And now I'm going to introduce Gerdo Aquino. And uh, very excited that he is here this afternoon. He is the uh, firm-wide co-CEO of SWA, an award-winning international landscape architecture, planning, and urban design firm based in LA. Gerdo is a big thinker, designer, author, and educator based in LA, and is known for his research interests in reimagining the public realm as a means to improve quality of life within the dense densifying urban fabric of our cities and towns. Issues of urban ecology, resiliency, mobility, air and water quality, programming and access to open space frames much of his work and serves as the foundation of, public, of his public lectures around the world, including APA Florida. He's a licensed architect uh, in eight states, and uh, this one's gonna pain me a bit. He holds a bachelor's degree from the University of Florida. There we go. Uh, knew it was coming. And he earned his master's degree in landscape architecture from the Harvard University Graduate School of Design. He's also, <laughs> there we go, there we go. <laughs> uh, he's also an adjunct associate professor at the University of Southern California. Anyone? No? Okay. <laughs> Uh, where he's taught a graduate level design studio for over 10 years. And with that, thank you and welcome to Gerdo Aquino. Thank you. All right, how's everyone doing? How are those gators doing, by the way? Doing okay? All right. Um, thank you for, for having me here. It's really, it's really an honor to speak to this audience, to be here in, in South Florida, to be 
talking about all the myriad of issues that are happening in the United States. Uh, you know, I, for a minute there, I thought maybe I can talk about current events, but then so much has happened in just the past two weeks that it's uh, impossible to even really pinpoint one. So what I'm going to do today is, is talk a little bit about um, the issues that are important, I think, to our profession in planning and landscape architecture, urban design, and how uh, those issues can find their way into a few case studies that I'll share with you. So let's, let's just start. Um, first, uh, this is a, a diagram of my organization, the, the diagram on the right. <laughs> and it's, it's next to a starfish because, uh, you know, as many of you know, starfish is a very resilient creature. So if something were to happen to me as CEO of the firm, there are many other leaders in the firm. And as a 100% employee-owned company, this is really important to us. And it allows all of our leaders to kind of get out there and do the things that they feel is important and to lead uh, in the best way that they can. Uh, we're a firm that believes that research and investment in research and education is, is critical to how we can understand the future. And so these are just kind of some of the initiatives that is, are currently going on in our firm. And so um, this is Los Angeles. Uh, it's a kind of a cartoon, but I love this image because somebody in my office created it. And I asked them, I said, well, why did you draw it like this? Why, did, why does it look like this? She said, and they said, well, because in, in Los Angeles, nobody knows that we actually have nature, that we actually have a river in our city, and we have all these great parks, but nobody knows it. It's somewhere in these layers. And, and I'm all about trying to extract all those layers and figure out how to make them public space and to make them natural. Um, I'm, I'm also a little bit of a futurist in a, in a good way, in a productive way. I do, these, I do these sketches. This is a sketch I did um, for, uh, for University of South uh, Southern California where they were trying to imagine what a natural system in the city might look like. And I think it could look like this. Maybe there are spaceships one day. I mean, we're already getting there with uh, some of our technology and maybe our rivers could be multi-benefit, uh, not just for nature, but maybe for people too uh, as a transportation mode. We don't know. And I'm also very interested in, in some of the uh, studies that Olmsted did many years ago, right? He had these amazing visions for parks in Boston and New York. But some of you may or may not know that he also had a vision for Los Angeles. If only he did this, uh, our city would be a lot better. A connected green network of open spaces. Of course, we have none of that. Um, we're working on it, but it makes me uh, think that we could do something. If he could think of it 100 years ago, we can do it today. This is our uh, main square in Los Angeles. This is how it looks today. I like to think of it like this. Uh, there you go. That's, that's really what it would look like if we didn't do anything to it. It's really just kind of a desert landscape. Um, the kind of recreation would be dunes and, you know, kind of surfing on dunes. And, and we would have to adapt to it. And, and I think the way we uh, look at our landscapes today, I think, has to be challenged a little bit if we want to think about sustainable cities. You know, it's all about trying to think a little bit outside the box, and you may or may not like it, but it's, it's a healthy thing to do as, 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 a, as a planning exercise. And of course, uh, in California, we, we've had so many fires that all I can think about right now is I just need to irrigate my lawn, you know, I just... I'm a landscape architect, but I have this lawn patch in front of my yard, and, it's, and a lot of my colleagues give me a hard time about it. You know, it's like, oh, it should be gravel, you know? Or it should. Anyway. Okay, so I, I'm going to talk about kind of five or six main topics. This first one is important, I think, to all of us in this room, what's in a place? And this is a, a study that we did at our firm, and it starts with this guy. I don't know if, does anybody know William White and his studies? Right, okay, there's, there's, there's quite a few in here. This guy was great. He did this, uh, this little study in New York. He had this camera. You can see his photo there with his camera. And he just observed public space in New York. He watched how people interacted, and he documented it. And it was really simple. He had observations like this. People tend to sit where there are places to sit. 
you know, and he took photographs of like this guy who, you know, he wasn't discouraged by the little anti-seating device, right? A little piece of cardboard. But he had these great observations. He, have, he did this one too, right? Uh, he, narr he narrated these. Uh, these are just kind of words that, he, that came from his voice. And, uh, and, you know, this probably still happens today, but it's so obvious, you know, these kind of things that happen in the public realm. And so what we did is we said, well, that happened, you know, decades ago. What if we did it today? What kind of technology, what kind of approach could we bring to it today that William White didn't have uh, in his hands back then? So we created this, this little booklet. Um, it's similar in, in terms of observations, but we used um, heat sensing technology and other kind of mapping technologies to study how people moved in a space. Uh, we used um, a combination of drones and other technologies. And what that allowed us to do was create kind of a William White 2.0. And what you're seeing here is a heat mapping exercise where the green represents kind of high traffic. And as you get towards the violet colors, it's kind of less traffic. And you could do it as a post-design study uh, to see if your design is actually functioning the way it, you wanted it to. Or you could even do it as kind of a pre-design with like full-scale mock-ups and things. Uh, so we looked at New York, the same place William White studied. We looked at a number of different spaces. And then we came up with these kind of fun, um, almost educational but usable diagrams. And we gave them names. So this one's like called channelization. And it's kind of people moving along a corridor, kind of like the High Line in New York. We, we kind of see that as the channelization of people. And then we call this one lizarding. People just kind of laying out on a big open space, getting sun, um, enjoying themselves. We call this one the entertainer. You know, there's always the kind of uh, design where you can sit in an amphitheater and somebody can kind of have the limelight and have the, the stage. And then this one's been fun. Um, cockroaching, so we, we observed a lot of people moving along the face of buildings. Maybe there was shade there, maybe there was something else happening there. And then of course, uh, my all-time favorite, um, oh, viewphilia, uh, which is really popular right now, which is to get people to a high point, to kind of see out into the landscape, to see their city in a different point of view. Um, and a, a lot of designs and programming uh, is really a way to kind of shape these kind of places. And so viewphilia is, is something that I'll talk about later, actually. Okay, so this first project or case study, is, uh, I'm calling it the disadvantaged. And uh, maybe it's in Florida, maybe it's in New York, maybe it's in California, maybe it's across the U.S. But there are always these places that are underserved. They, they need open spaces to, to be health, healthy and well but they don't have any money, they don't have any champions. This guy, Ricardo Lara was a senator and he was a champion for this project. He grew up in this neighborhood, he got people to think about open space in a different way, that it could be about equity. He found ways to get, in California we have a Prop 84 which is money allocated for parks. Um, I don't know if you have something like that here in Florida but uh, it's earmarked, it's competitive, uh, but if you're a good grant writer, uh, you can get that money. And uh, he was able to pull all that together and allow this park to happen. Let's see. Okay. But, you know, it's, it's never easy, as we all know, to, to get grant money or to get any funding. You have to prove it. You have to let the decision makers understand why they should give you the money. And so we did all of this research on park need. Uh, this part of LA was the highest in park need based on these kind of metrics. You know, th this area had, I think, half acre per thousand people versus LA County was eight acres per thousand. I think the national average is, I think it's something like five acres per thousand national average. Some cities like Boston have a lot more. Um, and so all these metrics kind of add up. We did an virus screen, you know, it speaks to um, the different kinds of pollutants in the area. And this one had a freeway next to it, so it's never good when you got a freeway 
next to your, your open space. Um, density and ethnicity, super dense, one of the densest areas of the city, and also one of the most diverse. Um, this area ha had a large population of, of, um, of Spanish, Mexican heritage, and a, and a few other ethnicities. Income, education, all low. I think 4% got a graduate, I mean a uh, college degree. So everything's working against them. And all of that added up to us winning or the city winning this one mile long park, which allowed almost everyone a quarter mile to half mile access to public open space. It was a big celebration, it was a big deal, and it also allowed uh, the public to start to have a place outdoors. I don't know if this is advancing. Is it, oh there it is, okay. And it was, uh, you know, it's one of those kind of sites where uh, you look around and it's right in front of you. You don't think about it, but it's right there. And, and that's what this park was. It was an abandoned right of way. LA used to have an extensive rail car line around the entire city. And now they're just these abandoned right of ways that flood. And sometimes there are car sales and other kind of sales going on in these places. Um, and because of the grant, it went from this right of way to a park. And this park has been wonderful to the city, to the community. It's a mile long, it's filled with program. The trees buffer the air, uh, the pollution that comes from this freeway. And of course, to be able to justify this, you know, it's, it's an ongoing set of metrics that we have to prove to everyone that okay, yes, you gave us the money, but here's how we're using it. It can't just be beautiful anymore. Maybe. 15 years ago, 10 years ago, you could argue that this is a beautiful park. Today, you can't do that. Uh, in a lot of cities around the US, you have to say why it's beautiful. What is the aesthetics of sustainability? What does sustainability look like? And so we created lots of diagrams. We did the metrics. Um, we supported it with uh, other kinds of uh, diagrams program. So with a mile long uh, park, you could have different types of program events, whether it's a children's park or a dog park or a gathering place, gardens. This thing is uh, having trouble advancing. I don't know if it's, okay. One of the other big factors uh, was getting out and exercising. And so we made sure that there were jogging paths and other kinds of access points around the park. Uh, places for people to walk their dogs, to be well, to exercise, and also to address shade equity. Uh, another big issue that's coming up in our cities where the image on the left is an image of the area where this park is, and that's a bus stop. I mean, that's, that's your bus stop. The image on the right is Santa Monica. If you know Los Angeles, Santa Monica is a really nice place, um, and they get money and they do cool bus stops with shade and advertising, because that's where the advertising money goes. They go where, to the areas where they think they have a captive audience. Our park uh, you know, had just had nothing going for it, and so this issue of shade is important. So we brought the shade. Um, we brought it big time. We increased shade by almost 35%. Um, we allowed the trees to create this contiguous canopy. We brought uh, shade canopies for outdoor classrooms. Um, and also introduced gardening as a way to uh, enhance STEAM learning, science, technology, uh, engineering, arts, and math. Not just STEM, but the STEAM is another big trend right now. The A being the arts uh, seems that it's becoming even more relevant as a way to be creative as part of learning. Okay, I'm just having trouble up here. Okay, and then stormwater. And this may seem like a lot of stuff, but uh, you know, again, we, we can't just say it's beautiful and we have to justify it. And so we said, you know what, not only is this park serving this community, but it's also cleaning water off the freeway. We're taking all that stormwater and turning it into uh, places where plants and people can interact. Um, 
The diagram kind of shows the mechanics of how that works. We work with a big team of engineers to do the quantities and to create places that, you know, start to give you that aesthetic of sustainability. It, you know, it's not just your, your trapezoid uh, water collection area, but it could be interactive. It could be a landscape that's part of a, a bigger vision. Yeah, this thing is, yeah, okay. I'm just gonna keep going here. Uh, nature play, also important. Uh, you know, uh, jungle gyms are great, and I think that's what I grew up in, right? A little jungle gym. But nature play seems to be uh, kind of where you want to be in terms of uh, finding a way to connect with nature and kind of reverse nature deficit disorder. Okay. All right. This project is about nature-based infrastructure. This is our project in Houston. Uh, some of you may know this. It's been published a lot. It's the Buffalo Bayou Promenade. So this is a historic image of downtown Houston. And what's interesting about this is you can see how the, this kind of languid body of water just kind of skirts the edge of the city. And that's pretty typical of kind of early American city growth. Um, sometimes it was a center. Sometimes it was at the edge. And Houston today, as we know, uh, well, it's not <laughs> about that. but. Um, Houston today now is, is, is kind of straddling the bayou. And so this project was, was really trying to figure out how can we make um, this landscape legible? How can we bring ecology to the forefront? And how can we address flooding and allow the citizens of Houston to actually interact with what they think is an amenity? Because that amenity uh, 15 years ago was that. That's what the center of downtown Houston had as, as its amenity, so to speak. And, and so the challenge was, you know, well, how do you bring ecology to this? How do you bring program to this? How do you bring people to this um, through a, a planning and landscape architecture exercise? And again, it kind of went back to the metrics. We had to prove to uh, the funding uh, mechanisms that there was metrics and ecology and benefit to the city, a benefit in terms of mental health, about health and wellness, infrastructure that was multi-benefit. And this diagram just kind of shows how this water body, this bayou, starts to become that uh, connector uh, fabric for the entire city to kind of pull it together. And it was, you know, from an engineering point of view, uh, it was fairly straightforward. We lean the, the slopes back they were fairly steep, which caused a lot of erosion. We leaned it back, we widened the channel. Um, and then we also introduced uh, plants as a way to control erosion versus geotextile. So we worked with arborists and plants people, botanists, to find plants that had deep roots so that when those large flood events came through, those plants acted as a kind of anchor for that soil. And by doing that, it created more biodiversity. Some of the plant, some of the animals and insects came back, and it's been a healthy um, ecosystem ever since. Sorry, there's oh, there's my buffalo fish. So now the buffalo fish has this little kind of environment in there. You may not see them, but they're in there. And then the programming that happened afterwards was was not even part of our doing. I think what happened was. The community in downtown found a platform to, to do something. And uh, they created their own program and events on weekdays and weekends. Uh, lighting became something that the artists took a, took a hold of and started to light up these infrastructure elements. And it became quite the spectacle, uh, including a oh, spectacle uh, when Harvey came in 2017. So this is an image that was taken. In Th all those images that I just showed you is all underwater in these images here. I mean, it's like 30, 40 feet of water going through the bayou. But we designed it so that it could be a resilient landscape, uh, a landscape that can take on the sediment and the erosion and the force of that water and allow the park to kind of return to what it was. This is an image of it um, right after the storm, all the sediment just sort of built up. And then uh, what we do with the sediment is we, we use them in areas of the city that need um, the sediment, 
Uh, otherwise, we uh, simply just kind of bring it back down to its um, original grade, uh, which is what the community wanted in terms of their programming. All right, so now this one takes you to Belgrade, Serbia. How, how many people have ever been to Belgrade, Serbia? All right, so Belgrade, Serbia, very interesting city. Um, the, the mayor at that time wanted uh, their city to be, car be part of the European Union. And to be a part of the European Union, they had to prove that they had the economics, they had the culture, they had the, the institutions that could kind of rise to the level. And this mayor felt that by creating or redeveloping this waterfront, they can start to inch towards that goal. And so it wasn't just creating a waterfront, but it was kind of stitching back the fabric of the city. You can see in this image, Old Belgrade was there, and you can see that striped yellow line was the, the way in which open space could start to kind of bring the city back to the waterfront. But there was also flooding. So there was this challenge of, of flooding that came down the watershed, and it became kind of this little spot there that's in pink where the water would just flood the entire lower area of Belgrade in a way that um, you know, created problems, a lot of issues, a little image of Belgrade. So there you go. So there's your kind of post-industrial waterfront that could be a, a vision for a public space. And so we worked with the city to figure out the priorities, how to deal with the issues. We worked with Arcadis engineers. Anyone from Arcadis here? Anyway, great engineers. Um, and we developed a, a system here in this section. So, so what we did is we raised the levee, um, and you can see the Sava Promenade is that kind of future public space, and there's the Sava River down there. But during flood times, um, we had this kind of deployable uh, levee wall that would uh, activate based on pressure that was built up. I don't fully understand it. I think it's, <laughs> you know, I love, I love the diagrams. I, I understand that part. But apparently if it's, if it's well oiled and there's not a lot of grit in there, the water, the pressure just pushes these things up. And what it does is it allows the public realm to continue uh, even through these kind of uh, major superstorms that move through there. So this is what it looks like today. This is the first phase of it. Um, it's a very narrow section. There's not a whole lot happening. I mean, it's only about 50 feet wide, but we got everything in there. We got the, the regional bike path. We brought in food trucks for, for F food and beverage. Um, we created different places for the community to, to gather and have events, places for children, art. We then also took all this uh, rail line. There's all this uh, extra rail that was just kind of laying around. So we turned it into bicycle um, uh, posts where you can lock your bike. We also kind of cut them up like a loaf of bread and welded them together and made tree grates out of them um, as a way to, to kind of repurpose some of that industrial material. It was a fun project and it continues to uh, get built out. This is the Nelson Mandela Park. Now we're taking you to Rotterdam. How many have been to Rotterdam? Yeah, cool place. And th these guys, they really get what it means to bring parks to the people. And in this case, uh, this was a neighborhood of Rotterdam that had uh, very little parks, but had a lot of people. A very diverse community, uh, very uh, multicultural, and thus the name Nelson Mandela, since he kind of, um, he kind of symbolized the kind of multiculturalism. And that area that you see there is where the park would be. They didn't know where to put it. We said, well, one of the things you guys do best is reclaim uh, land from the sea. So let's just do that. And, uh, and so that's what we did. So there you can see that pink outline is the future park. Uh, you can see in this diagram, the pink is where the park is. And you can see how the other big parks are in other parts of the city. So there was kind of an equity issue that allowed the park to really kind of get some momentum and get built. These are just comparisons of scale to other parks. So we weren't asking for a lot when compared to the other parks. And then the, you know, the thing that we always uh, deal with in, in, in what we do in this room is, you know, how do you start to shape the park? How do you give it meaning? Where do you start? We just said, why don't you start from the, the elevation of the levee? 
let the elevation be the, the level that you can enter into the park. And so that was the starting point. We took the city's goals. The city had very clear goals. They had these five goals that they wanted to achieve, which we checked those boxes. And we also worked with a big urban design team to make sure that connections were working. All these boats that are coming in and out of the water uh, were able to do what they needed to do. And then we also start to uh, think about what the community wanted. One of the community members, they kind of shouted at me during, uh, in Dutch, as I had to get it interpreted. I said, what did, what did she say? She said, oh, she said that you need to return it back to what it was. I'm like, okay, let's think about that. And so, so um, a couple of guys in, in my office, they turned the clock back. And you know, Google, they have that feature where you can kind of slide it back. And you can kind of see, well, they didn't have it for this area, so I was out of luck. But we interpreted a whole bunch of maps, uh, historic maps, and uh, we determined this is what it actually looked like. Um, it was all farmland with these little, little uh, villages kind of scattered through, but it was very, you know, green, agricultural. And so we, we used that as a way to talk about the return of green and creating kind of a village park uh, for the project. This is a community diagram where they wanted basically everything. They said, we want what that park has in that part of the city, and that part of the city has that, so we want that here. And so we really tried our best to pull it all in and create a park that had everything. And so what you're seeing there is a rendering of this park that is for everyone, can take in all those different programs. It's, it has open areas for flexibility, but it has other areas for ecology and connection with nature. It's a simple park, at least in plan view, we think it's simple. Um, the Dutch feel that it needs to be more complicated. And we said, you know, you know this is what the community interpretation was. I said, all right, fine. It, you're right. It, that's, that's what the community wants. It's not about what we want, it's what your community wants. And so this is what we're going to deliver to them. And it's going it's, uh, it's to be a I hate to say this, but it's going to be a beautiful place. <laughs> and uh, metrics aside, it's going to be a beautiful place. And um, you know, the renderings attempt to try to kind of paint that picture. As much as I understand metrics are important, I, I, I'm still of that generation where beauty still matters. Um, maybe I'm kind of a romantic at this point when it comes to these things, but um, I think it's great. This is the last project I'm going to share with you. I'm going to bring it home now. Well, I'm from L.A., so the Dodgers, you know. Um, no Dodger fans out here? Oh, got one. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right, so Hunters Point South. Uh, this has been a, a real case study for resilience uh, for, for, for us and for the engineers and for the city of New York. Uh, Arab uh, engineers worked on this project. And w I'm saying designing for resilience because... I think resilience could mean many things to many people. I think for us, you know, we, we tried our best to kind of define what resilience means to us at SWA. And when you kind of look at the very bottom, we think, we think those three items are important. The ability to self-organize, the ability to buffer extreme loads, the ability to adapt. I think now more than ever, we're finding that we, we do need to adapt. I mean, we can build amazing infrastructures, but we could also try to adapt where we want to live. And, and how we want to create that edge condition that allows nature to kind of pull itself into, into the city. This project tried to do that um, in different ways. There, there's a project in the Green Arrow there in Manhattan, of course. Um, so it's on the East River. Oh, there it is right there. So all that green area is, is all this open space that's being tied to a lot of promises of all this amazing urban fabric. There's a lot of pressure, right, on urban open spaces to do all these things, to support development of new roads, um, high-rise towers, infrastructure, and it has, landscape has its role. It also has to address climate change and resilience and create programs for people. I don't think there's any other time in my career where it's felt so heavy, that landscape and open space is, is feels so heavy that it's sometimes it, it feels kind of hard to breathe. 
You know, I'm not quite sure even how to address a mayor or a city council because I'm not sure what it is they want to hear. There's too much. And so projects like this had that kind of burden. It had to do all these things. And um, by any measure, I think it, I think it did a lot. Uh, it was an interesting area, another post-industrial kind of landscape that you see across the United States. Uh, it was very flat. It was prone to flooding. Um, you can see in this image, I'll just leave it here. In this image, this is a, a flood map uh, from Sandy and the areas that uh, would flood. And it's a serious issue. So, so you know, this notion of adaptation um, versus kind of armoring, it's, it's a very interesting one, and it's a debate that we're all kind of going through, I'm sure. Uh, this is a uh, Hurricane Sandy. Uh, yeah, it's, it was... It was rough. And, you know, of course, Hurricane Ida is, is kind of wrecking havoc over there in New York now. And, you know, I hope everybody there is safe and finding a way to kind of get around. Um, yeah, kind of going back to the current events thing. It's, yeah, sorry. I'm <coughs> okay. See, that, that's the heaviness that I'm talking about, <laughs> you know. Um, but again, you know, the metrics were really important. So again, I, I'm, I'm not showing as much, many metrics now because, you know, it's just kind of wearing on me. But it's there. Yeah, the metrics are there. And what it allowed us to do was shape the landscape so that it had the beauty that I think people could connect with and the program spaces that were important. Okay, there it is. All right, so that, that diagram that you saw earlier, that kind of blue area, this is, this is the park as it is today. So all that blue is now green along the edges. Uh, this is a project that has uh, been implemented over the past 20 years. The last phase was imp implemented just last year. Um, it's, it is beautiful, but it's also functional in terms of resilience. Uh, and I want to show you, um, I wish to show you. Let's see. Okay. So this is a, a diagram that showed um, kind of a regular flow uh, during kind of regular uh, tidal kind of fluctuation. It's fine. You'll never notice it. You could be in the park, and it's, it's cool. But we also did studies that show um, the impact of serious storms. I apologize. <clears throat> OK. All right, there. OK, so this was a 12-hour simulation of the sandy flow. And so the red uh, represents you know, those areas where it's uh, you know, very abrasive. There's a lot happening, a lot of turbulence, a lot of sediment moving. Oh, shoot. And then, of course, uh, through that modeling, Oh, there you go, okay. So through that modeling, it allowed us to, to confirm some of the, the shaping, adaptation, part armoring uh, of the park design. So where you see those kind of red or pinkish areas, those were areas that we really needed to armor. Uh, it was, wasn't about adaptation or allowing a lot of wetlands to, to mitigate storm. We had to armor it. It was just too extreme. And so the balance then became a park design that allowed us to do some interesting things, armoring versus adaptation versus, versus allowing the water to come in naturally. And so this right here, this image here is cool. So this is an area where the water is actually allowed to come in during those big storms. What you're seeing here is kind of a low to medium tide. It's a, it's a wetland or a kind of a marshy area. And it fills up with water, but not so much that that path could not be used. You can still walk on that path, even, uh, well, I don't know about today. I don't know, I, sh I should make a call. Find out if I can get somebody out on that path today. Um, but the park, you know, again, the park is trying to adapt to these serious issues, and, and that's, that's different than where we were with park design 10, 10, 15 years ago. We weren't doing these kinds of things, to, to my knowledge. 
you know, finding a way for park design and for resilience to really work together. This is part of the armoring. So uh, that structure you see on the left is, is an overlook. And then, of course, the image on, uh, sorry, the, the view closer to the bottom is where those areas of stormwater can start to filter into the park, um, allow the water to, to kind of uh, take on, or allow the landscape to actually take on some of that stormwater and some of that flooding as to not uh, flow into the city. Oh, sorry. Another image of that. Okay. Back to the metrics. <laughs> so, uh, again, required by the city and, uh, and by some of the, the federal agencies to prove to them that um, we could balance uh, uh, beauty and engineering. They wanted to see both together. They didn't want to see just a pure engineering diagram because they said some folks in their group really couldn't understand it. On the other hand, they didn't want an image that was just purely illustrative because then the engineers wouldn't appreciate it. So we had to we had to try to do both. Again, it's that that kind of that that heaviness that also goes into graphics. Uh, the, the graphics are, are really the tool to communicate all of these ideas, and and this one is trying to do that heavy lifting. It's showing how it's a performative landscape. It's a place for people, but it's also a way to talk about how nature and and stormwater and rising tide can start to work together. We have these bioswills that surround the entire project, and they take on 73% of annual rainfall, which is great. And then we have these little moments there. And what, one thing I want to point out is that path is probably three and a half feet wide. You know, and, and, and that, that's where it came down to, okay, what does code say versus what's right for this landscape? And we were able to get this three and a half wide path because, you know, ADA, it says four feet, but uh, technically, you know, three feet is enough. And we argued that it's kind of in an area of recreation, an area of kind of discovery and education, and we were able to, to do these kinds of things to get a three foot wide, three and a half foot wide path in there, which, you know, it's pretty amazing when the, when the plants are in full bloom in the spring, it really feels like a one foot path. And, um, to have that kind of experience in an urban setting is, is pretty amazing. We created a little island, um, so it's kind of a destination for you. You can get out there. On the other side of this, this uh, maple tree bosque of trees is an amphitheater that looks out over the city. The wetlands uh, become that kind of foreground that allows you to, to kind of, or uh, pulls you into the project. Oh, here's, here's an image of that path. Again, you know, it's super narrow, but, um, you know, for, for those who live in the city, to be able to connect with nature in, in a different way like this, it, it's, uh, it means a lot to everyone we've ever talked to uh, out when they're out there in the project. We worked with artists, so those round things you see there, they're, they kind of glow based on the lunar. I, again, I don't understand it completely, but... The way the artists spoke about it, it seemed kind of beautiful. Uh, but they glow in the dark and they change color, again, based on calendars and other things. But they're also cool to sit on. And then going back to where I started, I'm going to wrap it up right now. Uh, Viewphilia, that was my favorite um, uh, diagram from our research. And uh, we would have been remiss if we didn't do that here. And so... Um, with that, I just wanted to conclude and, and just say again, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to, to share the, these thoughts with you. I think it's, uh, it's such an important time for, for all of you and for all of us to work together and, and figure out a way to improve the quality of life in our cities. Design, design does matter, uh, and so does planning, and I think there's a way to kind of integrate both in a, in a meaningful way, in a different way that might start to lean more towards, you know, something that we haven't seen yet. You know, I, I would challenge all of you to, when you look at your work, if you already know what it looks like, you should try it again. You, sh you should really try to look at your work and, and try to think, well, maybe I don't know what this looks like, 
Maybe there's another process I could bring into this project that might reveal something different, something kind of surprising. And, and I think, to me, that's what makes what I do worthwhile, and, and I would imagine it's the same with all of you. There's got to be something in it for you to make it exciting and different and worthwhile so that when you, when you look at your career, um, you can look back at those moments when you, you, know, you kind of explored a little bit. It's not for everyone, but I, I, think it's, I think for the planning profession, I think it's absolutely necessary right now uh, in this time. And uh, with that, I thank you for your time and happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Oh, I think there's I think there's a microphone somewhere. Oh, there it is, right behind you, sir. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Quite informative. You've done a lot all over the world. Appreciate that. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Appreciate your presentation. My question is: Do you have any planners working on your staff? Thank you. Have what? Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. It's a new word. Planners. Do you have any planners working on your staff? Uh, yes, absolutely, of course. Yes, of course. Of course, of course. We, we have, um, we, we do have planners. We have planners, we have architects. Uh, we have a handful of engineers, uh, graphic designers. Um, we think that, you know, by understanding all these components, it, it'll just inform the work and make it better. Um, but yes, I think, uh, Almost every office of SWA has at least two planners uh, in, in there engaged actively in, in all kinds of work. Some of them write code or rewrite code. Um, so there, you know, we have some policy folks in there. And you know, with the infrastructure projects, uh, you absolutely need planners. Uh, you, know, you, you couldn't do these big infrastructure projects without planners on your team, especially inside your own firm. Thank you for your presentation. I love the projects. And one of the things that intrigued me is it seemed to me that you kind of keep going back and looking at these projects over time to see how they're performing, kind of comparing to your original plan and so on. And can you talk a little bit about the challenges and the necessity of tracking and tracking and monitoring for your performance measures, please? Right. We, we, um, we refer to that process as a kind of like a post-occupancy. You know, you design it, you implement it. Cities will operate and maintain it for a while, but then at about five-year point, things change. You know, uh, agencies will change staff, um, priorities change, funding changes. So. It's important for us to, to go back in there at two years, five years, 10 years um, to really understand what it is we're contributing. You know, if we're contributing something that requires an enormous amount of operations and maintenance annually, and we have to do fundraisers every year to support the maintenance of this project, and the city can't do that, or don't have the capacity, or the time, or the interest to do it, then we gotta, we gotta change the way we do those things. And you know, certainly during the process, you, you have the indicators to, to tell you where you should go with the design and the planning. But uh, like I said, I think with cities, public agencies, um, you know, th th there's a lot of change happening in those, in those agencies right now. And we, we do document that, and then we do give it back um, to those agencies as a, <laughs> I don't know, how you call it. Sometimes they don't like to see it, you know. Um, they'd rather, like, why are you giving us this? We don't, it's for your own good. You should have this. Um, but, uh, you know, it's absolutely important. A part of every project we do, we, we do that post-occupancy report. Can you hear me? Um, back here. Uh, back here. Okay, I see you. Uh, hi, my name is Jacob York. I'm a student at University of Florida, actually. Um, I, I have a question. So a lot of your developments seem to be very waterfront. And I think, in fact, I think everything today was. 
and, and I'm curious, you know, with changes to sea level projections and, you know, a lot of unforeseens in that area of climate science, is, is there a risk, you know, that whatever we develop there, no matter how resilient, is going to be gone in 10 to 15 years just because we didn't see how bad it was going to become? Uh, yes. I, I do think um, there is always a risk. There's a risk in terms of the investment that goes into making those places and that it could be destroyed, you know, by one superstorm. But I, I, I think what outweighs that risk is the community need. In the communities that we work with, I mean, sometimes there's a sense of desperation to have even just a little patch of grass. And other times it's, you know, the city just needing to do something for a community that hasn't been done, uh, that needs it versus other communities in their city. Um, yeah, I, I mean, we've actually had projects that have been redesigned even after six years, you know, because maybe there wasn't enough programming or it wasn't flexible enough. And so I, I think, you know, again, as, as planners and, and landscape architects, I think we have to be flexible and, and not think that our project's gonna last forever. I mean, Central Park seems to last forever, um, but that's a, that's a you know, special kind of place that was carved out of the city. Um, you don't see too many of those kind of projects anymore unless it's a big airport that is transforming, then you have huge land to do that. But um, no, that's a good question. You know, it's, it's a question we think about all the time. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you, Gerdo. <laughs> Appreciate it. And with that, I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the conference, and we see you this evening at the reception. Thank you.